I would like to welcome to the B-Sides Tel Aviv stage an actual rock star, Yossi Sassi! Yossi and Yossi brought Nir Sayas! Yeah! So Yossi is a rock star. Nir got his pilot license at age 23, and now he has a skydiving license. So he can take the plane up in the air and then jump and bail out if it doesn't go his way. So Yossi has been with us at B-Side Tel Aviv a few yes. years. Yeah. Cheers, Yossi. Cheers, Nir. I want to really, I want you to enjoy this session. Everybody, this is a treat. It's a yummy, yummy presentation. <laughs> It's things that make you go, hmm. Mm. Let's go. Yum, Give yum. it up for them. Yeah, one yeah. more. Cheers, Karen. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, B-Sides Tel Aviv. So good to be here for the third time and my fourth talk in B-Sides Tel Aviv. Um, in my opinion, the best community, cyber community event in Israel. Uh, along with me, Nir. Hello, and everybody. today we're going to talk to you about uh, some forensic artifacts that make you go, hmm, uh, hmm, wow. So, uh, yeah. So a bit about forensic artifacts. Well, they're quite uh, uh, different than the ones you would expect Goldilocks to leave uh, for the three bears, right? Uh, I mean, she did a, a fairly good job. She didn't evade and bypass too much. Uh, she left a lot of clues on the way. Uh, but what we're going to talk to you today, and especially share insights and code, with emphasis on code and free tools today with you, that will be released to GitHub straight after, uh, is uh, some unique artifacts. Uh, you might know some of them, but essentially we took the time from our experience in the field and uh, baked them up together so you can get things that you don't find today in the, in the tool, set, uh, tool set that you know uh, currently available online. So a few words about myself, uh, new Etagia, AOC. Uh, I've been with the keyboards for a while, with code and everything between it. Uh, around two decades ago, I worked for Microsoft uh, and coded tools uh, in Windows Server, but since then, doing mainly independent work. I was also fortunate enough to be part of Javelin Networks with uh, ex-Israeli Air Force uh, uh, and uh, a guy from 9900 uh, that we sold to Symantec in 2018, uh, doing deception around Active Directory. Uh, and we're doing a lot of uh, assessments, uh, essentially, just enjoying myself uh, with computers uh, for a while. And I'll hand over to Neil. So hello, everybody. I have the honor to uh, share a stage with Yossi. Usually, I'm in the other side of the crowd. So uh, who am I? Uh, in a short uh, description, security researcher, the head of offensive uh, of uh, professional services at uh, Tenroot with Yossi. Uh, like I uh, was uh, introduced, I'm a licensed pilot, so I can fly a plane, but I can also jump in a plane, <laughs> from a plane, not particularly in that order, and not particularly <laughs> together. Um, I'm a former officer in the IDF and a GCFA, forensic analyst from SANS. It's one of my uh, certificates that is most relevant for today's talk. So let's dive in. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, put, some, uh, put the building blocks terms for you to understand, DF, IR, and threat hunting. Um, DF, digital forensics, so let's paint a picture. We are at a bank robbery. If the robbery has already left the bank, okay, we are the police, we got to the scene. Uh, so we are talking DF, right, digital forensics. We need to understand what happened, it's already finished, and we need to understand what happened in the scene. If we are getting to the robbery, while the robbery is still inside, we have hostages, we have everything uh, happening, the activity is still, Uh, taking place. This is incident response. We are um, uh, giving a response to a live event. Uh, now, in the digital world, it's a little bit more hard to say when it's digital forensics, when it's incident response. That's why we usually combine them together. When we're talking about threat hunting, we're uh, talking about a proactive forensics approach where we're trying to find evidence of breach before uh, anything even happen. Okay, it's something that every organization need to do to search actively in his network, in their network, uh, to try and find some evidence uh, of a breach. Now, uh, in digital forensics, we have two basic approach, the live approach and the dead approach. The live approach, basically everything that is live while the computer is still on. 
that is approach everything that lay in the NTFS, so that NTFS live equals to RAM. Uh, here we're going to just show a little tool, Cape, Coral Artifact Parser and Extractor. This uh, two taking both of the both uh, approaches together, and it has the models which responsible for the live approach. You will see ARP cache, all runs, DNS cache, everything that if return off the computer will uh, be lost. And the dead approach uh, basically let us take a terabyte of disk into only the two gigs that matters, the two gigs with a forensic uh, value. In the end, super timeline can be produced from the uh, dead uh, uh, NTFS drive, colored and everything. Here you can see a tool from Eric Zimmerman, Timeline Explorer, which basically take everything from web history, uh, the registry hive, event logs, everything you can find. Now, this picture, our picture from a real incident where we were able to construct um, the screen of an attacker after he left the, uh, the station a week back. Okay, so we were able to reconstruct what he actually did in an RDP session. Uh, you can see he, he approaches SQL prod backups. You can see the user he was using. Um, now, how did we uh, done that? Bitmap caching. So I don't know if you noticed, but when you are initialing an RDP session, the general have all the where you want to connect, who you're going to connect with, but the experience tab have uh, this little check, persistent bitmap caching check, you can see, that when it's checked, and by default it's checked, you get a lot of uh, cache files, a cache file for each RDP session, that logs your screen into a small bitmap 64 by 64 uh, pictures. Now, this is a cool evidence, but it's very hard to go in, a, uh, in an event where you have thousands of computers and understand what happened. And you'll see how hard it is to construct uh, these 64 and try to attach them into a screen. It takes well, some time. Yeah, you'll need a you know, function or two. But uh, still. <laughs> yeah. So for, for that reason, uh, we thought about hmm, what, what will happen if we will make something that make this process a little bit automated it. So we make a tool that, first of all, collect the RDP caches from the entire network. All the domain computers just give us the RDP cache. Mm -hmm. um, now, after that, we take it and parse it. We extract the bitmap, bitmap 64 by, si by 64 images out of it. We format it and scan it with an OCR mechanism, just extracting the text out of all the pictures. Then we take this text and um, cross it with an IOCs, indication of compromise. So let's say we have some station. Uh, so you can see the logs collected from all the computers. So let's say we have a station um, where the, a Mimikatz was, was made, okay, a Mimikatz executable was clicked. Maybe they passed all the antivirus, all the EDR, XDR solutions, but this text from the screen is still in the logs. Okay, so we made a little tool. You can see me uh, right now playing the attacker side, connecting uh, with the bitmap caching, uh, checked by default, connecting to a remote station using the user Annette. While I started the connection, you can see the cache file creates. I'm going to take uh, a malicious tool, malicious tool that we all agree upon, uh, Mimikatz, and I'm going to run this Mimikatz in elevated privileges. It doesn't really matter. I can run it however I want. Now, while everything is on the screen, all this text going to be recorded into the BMC files. Okay, so I'm going to make it as short as I can. Just open the Mimikatz and close it, but you will see that even a short period of time where the executable was live, okay, so now I'm running Mimikatz. So you can see the Mimikatz strings uh, on the screen. So even for a short period of time, uh, while, while this uh, screen was recorded to the cache, we will be able to construct evidence. So I finished my uh, malicious uh, intentions, 
closed everything, you can see 24 megabytes of cache file creates on one of the uh, station in the domain. Now let's move our, to our uh, tool. Our tool first of all collect, then parse the BMC, the bin file, then search for the IOCs. The IOCs are defined in this um, text file, okay, the IOC and what the IOC equivalent for, and the clients that we are going to run upon. So imagine we put all the clients in the domain, put our indication of compromise, and let it run. While it, while it runs, it basically, like we said, collects all the um, evidence from all the computers. The BMC and bin files becomes a small BMP, tiny pictures. These tiny pictures then, you can see the text extracted from all the pictures. You can also see some of the uh, collages. Collage. Yeah. yeah, we try to construct it to a screen. It doesn't, uh, it's, it's very hard to see it um, when you actually examining thousands of computers, but when you're using this tool, it's simply easy. So client 01 found with IOCs. For the user Annette, Mimikatz and Gentle Kiwi were found, so we have traces of Mimikatz. Client 02 found to be clean. And that's about it. Yeah, that's pretty cool integration, right? Yeah. So just, it's the collection, parsing of the files, uh, making the collage so the uh, OCR tool can work properly on them, OCRing them according to IOCs that you can uh, determine. You can feed it with any type of strings that you want, and actually uh, understanding those forensics. And many thanks to Rotem Lipovic and Dora Mit which were also part of this research with us. Thank you. Yeah. So a special thanks for them is also in our Git repository. You will yeah. get the Git. Everything uh, on Git. Everything yeah. on Git. Yeah. Okay, so the second artifact I want to examine with you is the prefetch. Prefetch is really the 101 of every forensic artifact, right? Uh, th that's how we get what was executed on our station. So Windows prefetch uh, fir first uh, introduced in Windows XP. Okay, since Windows XP, they have some evolvement, but it basic like every uh, artifact in Windows, it doesn't mean to track your uh, moves on the operating system, but just to speed up and make things more efficient. So the prefetch uh, try to make uh, portable executable that load to memory more efficient. The prefetch uh, can give us the eight less time of execution. So if you execute some executable a couple of times, we will get the eight less execution times. We'll get the first execution, the last execution, the path from where this uh, file was executed. If it's a keylogger, for say, let's take it to the malicious part, we'll get even maybe the uh, file where the keylogger logs your typing, your uh, keyboard typing. Um, so this is prefetch. Prefetch has a little bit of involvement, like I said, from Windows XP to Windows 8.1. It was, let's say, uh, uncompressed or uh, just in its uh, natural form. SCCA was the header, uh, XA 53, 43, 43, 41. Uh, in Windows 10, there's Express Hoffman get into uh, the scene. We compress all the uh, prefetch files, so it make it a little bit harder. They are no longer in clear text in memory, uh, if it's the RAM or the NTFS, uh, and now the Header is mum, 4D41, 4D04. So every time you click on executable, a prefetch is made. The second time you will click on the same executable, the first prefetch go to unallocated space on the NTFS, and the second prefetch takes its place with all the data he had and everything. And you will keep going, and every prefetch uh, just go and uh, left in memory, so if an executable runs at least twice, a, a .pf file uh, will float in the NTFS unallocated data. We take these assumptions and we want to demonstrate it. So first of all, we run Mimikatz once, we run Mimikatz twice, that's all. Now we're going to use sdelete, sdelete uh, from sys internals run over the memory. It's not just deleting the link to the file, but actually run it. We run the memory 10 times in these scenarios to make it extremely uh, emphasize the fact that it's no longer in memory. 
Now we take a tool called FDK Imager to load our NTFS to see all the hidden files and all the, uh, the files exist. So opening, and you can see the unallocated data space. Now just traveling and clicking one random, you can see the mom header. So this is mm -hmm. a compressed prefetch in memory in unallocated space, something we already removed when we execute another file. Now we will just take them and uh, export them to the file system. We are concentrating here about the small ones because they are more likely to be prefetches. Also, they are the, le the, the one that adds less. So we just taking, we don't know which one of them going to be our prefetch, our destined prefetch, the Mimikat prefetch, but one of them, if I didn't lie to you earlier, should be. The, so, the size is good enough indication anyway. So. Yeah, the, the size is good enough indication, and this is a, a POC. We will talk a little bit about what we uh, saw. So here I'm just trying some PowerShell to make the uh, extension of the file I extracted a .pf because it's necessary to run PECMD. Again, a tool by Eric Zimmerman that let us uh, just check a, a directory and it will parse it for us. So if it's not a prefetch, it will not parse it. If it's a prefetch, it will decompress it and parse it and give us the answers. And you can see that um, we had 73 files and voila. So the first one was Mimikatz. You see the run count is one. Yeah. Okay, it makes sense, right? The first run was uh, same yeah, in yeah. Windows Prefetch. The second one was moving to the unallocated space and took her place. Uh, okay, and that's a little bit about it. That's very cool. And that's something, thank you very much. And keep in mind that uh, while in volatility, uh, for example, in other cool frameworks, you can get it uh, from memory, from RAM, uh, you don't have an option to do it on disk, right? And in this way, we managed by matching the, the, uh, the right hex uh, addresses to just fetch yeah. that uh, quite easily, leaving off the land, most importantly. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Nir. Woo. Woo. So moving on to other interesting uh, forensic artifacts, uh, let's speak about Hacktive uh, Directory. Uh, really something I've spent uh, uh, two and a half decades with uh, this technology and it still keep us, keeps to amaze me and everyone, all of us uh, around here from uh, zero logon through uh, whatever, print nightmare and uh, etc. And uh, Active Directory is something very hard to uh, put your hands and, and your full grasp around it. It's, uh, it's a huge attack surface, it's exposed by design and really the lack of knowledge and deep understanding of uh, the multiple technologies related there, right? LDAP, DNS, Kerberos, WMI, RPC, DCOM, Summer, ADSI, all the DB interfaces, ADWS, I'm not even warming up, so. Uh, active Directory Forensics can be quite tricky. Uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's popular uh, in the Microsoft Windows networks like TCP IPs in the world of, of networking. It's, uh, a very, uh, it's a perfect tar target central authentication, access control, uh, management, all the authorization of the network, and it is exposed by design in a 90s uh, kind of design, especially uh, before cloud, before virtualization, before a lot of vectors were uh, abused and exploited as they are. A lot of misconfigurations, excessive permissions, tools like Bloodhound and the likes that know to explode those, uh, uh, those vectors and those graphs. And essentially, when we come to an event, we want to try and understand who did what and when. So to build the timeline based around the entities, meaning identities, user accounts, and computer accounts, and to understand the gar around reconnaissance, lateral movement, and all types of credential theft, and to see if there are backdoors left in the AD infrastructure. So one source of knowledge can be, of course, logs, uh, especially all types of, uh, not only files, but uh, ETW, event tracing for Windows, all kinds of event logs. Uh, but many of those uh, events uh, are not turned on by default, and even if they are in uh, events like ransomware and others, uh, they, can be, they can be wiped. So we see a lot uh, this, uh, event logs being wiped. You can also get the approach of a sensor, right, to, to essentially get a pickup uh, to sniff uh, uh, the packets on the domain controllers, and some commercial companies actually do that. 
but it is very, very challenging still to understand what happened in the environment once it's compromised. Uh, we tend to go for uh, a built-in uh, artifact called, uh, called the replication metadata and linked values. So this property, uh, REPL property metadata, exists on each and every object in Active Directory, right? And this actually saves uh, replication information that was exchanged between domain controllers, and it saves it on the objects. So it's, uh, it sits uh, directly on the NTDS DIT, on the AD database file, the physical file on the snapshot or system backup, and it has nothing to do with the logs. Uh, and also, uh, anything that happens in communication-wise will be saved to this log. So wouldn't it be nice if we had a tool that can actually look back in time even if we have no domain controller online, all our domain controllers got their security logs wiped or they got ransomed and we just have a backup, uh, let's say from the Maersk uh, incident, we just got a, a backup from one DC in Africa and from that we have to reconstruct the network but we still want the forensic evidence. So, would be nice, right? But there is no such tool until today. So. What we're going to do in this scenario, we're not, I'm not going to show you a code, I'm just going to go through the scenarios, but I'm going to share, the, we are going to share the code with you afterwards on uh, GitHub. So we're going to search for uh, interesting strings in your Active Directory, which, which I suggest you'll do right after this talk, you might be surprised. Then we're going to find some renamed accounts, suspicious renamed same account names. Then we're going to discover all the logs were wiped and we don't really have a SIM or we lack some, uh, the right artifacts in the right logs in the SIMs are not collected. And then we have ta -ta -da, AD replication metadata to the rescue with an automated script that is shared online. So we're going to begin to hunt for that user Annette, which we saw in the bitmap cache hunter, BMC cache hunter. Uh, and we're just going to query it from AD. But oops, uh, we don't have a user named Annette. That's weird because we have other uh, tacit forensic evidence from the computer, from the RDP cache, that we had a user. So first of all, I uh, encourage you, if you didn't do so already, to enable AD Recycle Bin. I don't know if all of you are aware of it, but for a while now, around a decade, we had a feature uh, that can keep uh, deleted objects and reanimate them uh, when we want. The first script uh, that we'll share with you is a script that essentially very simply searches for any string you want in the entire uh, Active Directory uh, object tree. Uh, so this looks for a match um, everywhere in all the properties of all the objects in the entire tree recursively. So, for example, this, uh, you know, benign string, uh, 90210 uh, from Beverly Hills, uh, this is a, a file time uh, password last set attribute. If we look uh, for this, uh, for example, for the word password, try to do it at home on your network. So you will see some benign results like password replication policy, or perhaps maybe a, a lapse enabled computer from uh, the local administrator password solution, etc. Uh, but on the way, we find something interesting about a password reset by username Danette. And that happened in June. That's not, not too long ago, right? Yeah. So something is fishy here. Uh, you, if you want to just uh, separate uh, this specific finding using the same script, so we're just going to search for Annette and show this uh, match details. Uh, so there you go. So, that, that's that's uh, some evidence that maybe something was uh, renamed Annette there. So the, we're going to look for uh, renamed users. What this script does is it looks for specific events where uh, the same account name was renamed. This is quite an unusual step, right? If, if you know uh, a bit and you're managing networks, you know renaming the user logon name essentially. Uh, it's not something that happens every day, only when it's, uh, you change the prefix, etc. And we see the user Annette, previous M account was Annette, but now it's called Jane D, uh, essentially Jane Doe. And uh, so we're going to look, and uh, for example, in this case, we find also in the logs, we can see the user Annette got renamed to Jane D. So now we know we have to hunt for the current entity named Jane D inside uh, the uh, Active Directory application metadata. So this simple script, again, living off the land, no dependencies, no special permission. You can run it from any uh, machine. It doesn't require any specific uh, special model. We run it directly with the native APIs. Uh, you can see all the changes that happened to this user since it was created, since its birth, essentially. So you can see it was created back in 2016. You can see the password was reset. You can see uh, the assignment of the different same account type. You can see it got populated 
uh, with some attributes. Essentially, we see it was an automated script because you see the timestamp, everything happened in the same timestamp. Essentially, a human cannot change the company name, department, etc. But more interestingly, the last uh, evidence we see sorted but origin originating change time, it was a privileged user. Admin count one means that this user was in the past or still is a member of a privileged user uh, group in Active Directory. Account operators, backup operators, sprint operators, server operators, schema admins, enterprise admins, and, <laughs> and we also see it has a CD story populated, uh, usually, but you see the read, the relative ID is 500, means it has a CD story, perhaps for migration, maybe legitimate, but that's something that uh, should have been cleaned after the AD migration took place, and 500 always is suspicious. So now we're gonna run uh, a different tool, and this tool, get AD group changes, essentially yet another open source PowerShell tool. Uh, we're gonna query uh, the group cha membership changes for this user, Jane D. And when we query the changes, we, we are gonna see exactly when this action occurred in time. And pay attention, this happens regardless of your logs. You don't need to collect anything, right? This is directly from the raw NTDS DIT file uh, in Active Directory. So uh, we can see it was a member of backup operators for two hours, which is suspicious enough that it was added and removed. The last action was removed, uh, and we can see exactly on what date it happened, and this can help us tie, out, tie down uh, the timeline of the attack. Now we're gonna output to a grid uh, all the membership uh, changes, additions, removals of uh, domain admins, right? So uh, in this group, a quite interesting and known group, we see there is a user named Terry. Now this user, last action, last change that happened to him in this group, it was removed, but we can see that the member admin count attribute was reset. Now, that's peculiar because if, uh, and the last change, it, was, it happened 145 days ago. So if a, a sysadmin did that as a maintenance uh, thing, whatever, so that's okay. But if nobody in the IT department knows about that and, and it was removed, that means you don't have evidence about that in the log. The user was a member of a privileged group. It was removed and the uh, attribute that indicates it was a privileged user was maliciously removed uh, just before uh, getting it out of the machine. So, and, and we're gonna query again uh, Terry, uh, and we see exactly this evidence also directly uh, from the tool, from the command line. So, uh, in this case, until now, we queried live data. We're just querying an online DC, a domain controller that answers our requests, and, and we get all this metadata back from the meta repl uh, replication uh, metadata. Uh, but what we're gonna do now is essentially uh, we're going to move to uh, a Windows 10 machine. We're going to work offline. So until now, we worked with the live domain, right? You see uh, the distinguished name of the domain we've worked at, and we have a like local logon server, blah, blah, blah. We go out of the VM. We work on a Windows 10 machine, right? This is an offline machine. Uh, there you go. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the same tool, get AD group changes, uh, to query an offline database file. So either you take it from a system state backup or a snapshot in NTDS util. Uh, all we need is the NTDS dit, right? The dit file, uh, the NTDS uh, directory information tree. And uh, now we're gonna query this uh, file offline. This is very useful because you can use this offline backup either when uh, uh, you need to query the information uh, for forensic evidence outside of the customer premise, or maybe the network is down, maybe you cannot access those domain controllers, that's another scenario, or maybe all the domain controllers got wiped, and while the other team is uh, focusing on DR, on recovery, so you can do forensics. And as you can see, we're uh, specifying the parameters, the switch for using an offline AD backup, giving it the uh, location uh, from, from our standalone workstation, we can query that. You can see what the tool does, it essentially loads the database in memory as an LDAP server, looking for a, a, an available port, and uh, now we're, we're querying essentially a running instance, a live instance of this, uh, of your AD server in an, in an offline environment. And we're querying all this forensic data directly from this offline environment. Uh, we're gonna dive a bit more and uh, look uh, in this case, for example, we're gonna use the existing offline DB instance for performance, and we're gonna take out a report of all group membership data. And essentially what we're gonna get 
is all the changes, removals, privileged users or not, of, uh, that were done in these domains since its creation. So everything that happened in this uh, domain, whether you, you have some uh, tools that uh, do that or do that partially or etc. so now you have this free tool that does all this for you. So you can run it uh, just to monitor changes in your environment or uh, God forbid if you have to do it uh, during an incident response or an investigation. Uh, open source, PowerShell, no dependencies, you don't have to install any module. We worked quite hard on that. Um, no special permissions. Right? You just query it uh, in LDAP, and this data is available read-only. Or if you're offline, we made sure that the instance, by default, it's created for admins only. We removed the token, uh, so you can uh, query it from a normal user. And this grid, living off the land, so you can just filter it, and you get any results you want by any name, you know, any username, any machine name whatsoever. And that's just up on GitHub as we speak. Thank you. <laughs> Always fun. So, to sum up, uh, very cool, this world of forensic artifacts, uh, but some of those artifacts are really uh, far from getting them out of the box. Uh, not all of them are turned on by default, and attackers can essentially wipe your logs or try to do really sophisticated stuff. Yet, with some knowledge and, and essentially insight and integration of sources, you can really come up uh, with uh, useful tools for yourself. We encourage you in this cat and mouse chase uh, I come especially uh, more heavily uh, from the offensive side, and with the years, I try to help the blue team as much as I can, uh, playing this in and out, because it's a, an unfair battlefield and trying to give a fair chance for the defenders. So try to practice a before, during, and after approach, meaning don't wait for the incident to have the tools and knowledge and mindset. Just read about, uh, take those tools, the one we mentioned also in this talk, there, there is a bunch more that is very useful and free, uh, driven by the community. During the event, know what to do about that. And after the event, make sure in the post-IR that you don't leave any uh, stones unturned, you know, any backdoors or persistence mechanisms, whether it's in the host level or in the network level. Um, and check out our gits uh, yeah. from uh, the tools that we just uploaded. You won't get disappointed. <laughs> you won't be disappointed. Won't. Cheers, thank you.